many of you, most of you today, have understood that there is this thing called the glycemic index. Am I speaking some sense here? Where people have, yeah, exactly. So again, when 20 years ago, people hadn't heard about it, but uh, and these researchers, David Jenkins, back in 1981, wrote the first well, paper where he put forward this notion, where you judge a food against it's a, a judge a food as to its glu blood glucose raising capacity. And when it, and you can even classify them as to be safe, risky, and unsafe. Now, glycemic index is important, but actually, what is more important is what the insulin is doing, because you've just seen all the mischief that insulin can do. And so they've now done, well, quite a while ago now, insulin indices. So I thought it'd be interesting just to show a few that you might not have seen. This is the insulin index for eggs. Incidentally, protein also does generate a, an insulin response. So protein and carbohydrates or starches together, sugars, can multiply up. Fish is okay, that's there too. Bananas, are st these are green bananas, so they can, they're starting to get in the risky area. Uh, and bread is now definitely into the uh, dangerous area. A yogurt, surprisingly, is right up there, a very high insulin response. And potatoes are there. The message there is, yeah, the high glycemic diet is one of the major problems in today's world why most people are, are having, are subject to so many of these various diseases of civilization, but it's not the only one. Um, when we look at these foragers, yes, they are skinny. Uh, this chap's just caught a couple of goannas. He's an Australian Aboriginal, the, the kind of lizard. He's going to take them home and eat them. The point about it is this, that uh, foragers would tend to have quite a low body mass index, around 18 or 19. They would be quite low body fat, 8% for the men, perhaps for a little bit more, 12% for the women. This is off the, almost at the bottom of the scale of what is re normally regarded as being healthy levels for Westerners. And yet everything we know about human health suggests that this is the way to be. And we could kind of see that why this might be. Uh, after all, they're not going on this nasty switchback of high, high uh, uh, glucose levels, um, they're not feeding cancers, this kind of thing. More importantly, they're feeling hungry from time to time. Uh, and this is a part of, a vital part of, retuning the body's biochemistry. When you feel hungry, you actually reverse the process that insulin has just done. The body has to secrete the opposite hormone called glucagon, which drags then fat out of the fat cells and puts sugar back into the bloodstream. And at the same time, this glucagon is doing undoing all the mischief that insulin might have done. In other words, you less, you more, you won't, you'll, have, you'll have blood thinning going on, you'll have bone building going on, you'll be improving your immune system, you won't be having the depressions and all the other things that we saw. It'll be op operating in the opposite way. Glucagon is the opposite, the antidote, if you like, to insulin. Now, one of the things we don't do in today's world is actually give ourselves a chance to get a little hungry from time to time. I'm not talking about fasting, not to talking about starving ourselves and just saying these guys would be hungry for two or three hours or an hour before they had the next meal. And today we don't allow ourselves to get there. The second thing is, as many of us perhaps of uh, my kind of generation can remember, that we'd often get up from a meal still feeling a little hungry, ready for some more. And now we kind of eat until we're sated. Um, which again is probably not a great idea, although I have to say I have difficulty getting up from a meal still feeling, feeling a little hungry. So when did it all start to go wrong? Well this is a timeline I'm going to put up and we're looking about 11,000 years ago. Going back to our story, these peoples about 60,000 years ago were successful, they were multiplying. And they were spreading out over Africa and then out into Asia. They got down to Australia very fast, about 55,000 years ago. Uh, they filled up Asia again quite quickly. It took them a little longer to get into Europe, perhaps about 35,000 years ago. The Neanderthals were there and they were fighting each other for space. Uh, and then finally, about 12,000 years ago, they got across the Bering Strait into the Americas. And very quickly, uh, after about 1,500 years, they were all the way down into Patagonia. And by that time, the world was filled up with foragers, still needing 200 square miles or thereabouts of territory per band of 50 people. They were fighting each other for living space, until one day, 
one group discovered how to live on just two square miles instead of 200 square miles. And they did it by taking control of their food supply. Instead of just wandering and taking their chances as to what was there would be all right for them, they made sure that what they had was going to be okay for them, that would keep them alive. So for the first time in the history of the human species, people planted. This was the famous farming re revolution. It happened for the first time in the area we called Kurdistan, there in the Middle East. But the two difficulties with that. First of all, they didn't plant what they would normally be eating. They planted what it was possible to plant, possible to harvest, possible to grow and, and cultivate and bring and save through the winter time. And secondly, they reduced right down the range of plants that they were eating from, from over a hundred down to just three or, four, three or four. So for the first time in the history of the human species, people began to eat a new food group. They began to eat bird seed. Here they are. The first ones were wheat and barley. We're talking about grains. So later on came rice and rye and, and, and oats and the various other grains, the corn, the maize, that we know about too. But they're all basically grass seeds. Human beings are not designed to eat grass seeds. What might be the problem with it? <clears throat> the problem with grass seed is, first of all, they're starchy. And starches are nothing other than sugar molecules linked up together. The body unzips those back into sugar in nanoseconds. A slice of toast hits the bloodstream just as fast as two or three teaspoonfuls of sugar. So right there, you're off again on this insulin iceberg. Secondly, grains are micronutrient poor. We've talked about why we're we eating a micronutrient poor diet. Well, because partly because we're eating a lot of grains which are poor in micronutrients. In fact, you might even wonder why it is that on the side of the cornflakes packet it says this has been fortified and there's a little list of vitamins and minerals and so on. It's a pathetic attempt to compensate for the fact that it is micronutrient poor. Of course, it doesn't allow for the tens of thousands of micronutrients that are really the human body needs, the bioflavonoids, the phenols, and the carotenes, and all the rest of it, which all really need to be working in harmony together for it to work properly. Second, thirdly, these uh, grains are, they contain anti-nutrients. In other words, they contain plant poisons which our human body as plant predators have not naturally adapted to. And these plant poisons have got names like lectins, alpha amylase inhibitors, or alkyl resorcinols and so on. Don't have to remember the names, just remember that they're creating mischief. We didn't know about these 20 years ago. Um, but they're silent poisons, background poisons, silently undermining our, cell, uh, our bodies in various kinds of ways. For example, some of the lectins uh, some of the lectins are um, uh, some of the lectins are uh, making our colon more porous, so they're joining in with the bad bacteria, making the colons more porous, leaky, making our colons more leaky. Uh, they are depressing human growth hormone, so that uh, you may say, well, I'm grown up, do I need to worry about that now? Well, yes, human growth hormone is used the whole time you're secreting it in your bodies to renew your cells, so you age faster if you're not secreting human growth hormone. They interrupt DNA maintenance. You're more likely to have DNA uh, problems uh, uh, leading to cancers and so forth. So they are creating a lot of mischief, uh, those anti-nutrients that are in grains. Um, we've known, we, we all know about one of the big ones, of course, uh, gluten. Uh, many people now, gluten is a really mischief, big mischief maker. It gets down into the colon, it makes the colon again more leaky, it gets through into the bloodstream, it is depressing bone building, it is depressing mood, creating all kinds of mischief too. So, the grains are basically for the birds. <laughs> um, then, much later, came a tuber into the diet that Chaucer hadn't heard of, that Shakespeare only knew of as pig food. Yes, it's the potato, and potato suffers from many of the same problems. It's starchy. So right there, insulin iceberg. And we saw how the potato had high insulin index as well. It is micronutrient poor, and it contains some pretty nasty plant poisons, the glycoalkaloids. Uh, they attack the central nervous system. People who die of potato poisoning usually die of heart failure or, or uh, uh, restricted bowel and so forth. Yes, indeed, people do have potato poisoning and people do die of it from time to time. Nobody tells you much about this, but the reality is that potato is not normal human food. Uh, so quite apart from the poisons, it is actually the problem to do with the, uh, with, with the uh, glycemic control, which is perhaps the most important thing. Um, 
And then, of course, when we think about the sweetness that these foragers had, apart from their loved ones, the only sweetness these foragers had in their lives was basically honey. And when we look at how uh, foragers uh, managed to get honey, and it was not an easy job, they were, they, they were the fearsome African honeybees, you had to smoke them out and they're buzzing around your head and everything, and you had to dip your hand into a hole in the tree and pull out whatever was there. Um, but they liked it, they would do it, it was a big deal. Uh, but they were only consuming, it, was, it is calculated and measured to be only about four pounds per head per year. And that was the state of affairs for many years until sugar plantations, sugar cane was found in, in, East, in Asia, in Indonesia, brought over to the West Indies and the sugar plantations got going and sugar uh, became a part of the, the diet. And sugar too, of course, suffers from exactly the same problems. It gives us this glycemic response. It is micronutrient poor. It is empty calories. <coughs> uh, and just to see the sugar consumption stayed pretty much down at that level of four pounds per head ye per year until about 1800 when by now, and this is America, these are American figures, it, up, it is up to over 160 pounds per head per year. So we have multiplied by 5,000 percent the amount of sugar that people are, are consuming. And you can be sure that if that's the case, then this is creating havoc also with our biochemistry, just like I talked about. When we looked at our savanna environment, it was a fairly low fat environment, not particularly low fat, but a fairly low fat environment. Um, and in particular, the foragers would be eating animals which only had 4% body fat. The plants, most of the plants didn't have any at all, but they would be eating nuts, mongongo nuts, for example, uh, and the baobab nuts, which would be 50%, 45-50% fats of various kinds. What's important to know is the types, the particular fatty acids. We kind of know about saturated fats, we know about monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Well, we need to go more into the detail, because it makes a big difference when we're talking about a fatty acid profile. Back there, there were one or two saturated fats, like stearic acid, which our body handles perfectly well. Um, there were there monounsaturated fats, particularly in the brains that they were eating and the bone marrow that they would eat. But there were two particular polyunsaturated fats that were there, that were, so, were always there in such a way that if they're not, they sicken, you will sicken and die. They are essential fatty acids. And in the old days, they used to call them vitamin F1 and vitamin F2. And in a way, it's a shame we've stopped calling them that because uh, that would give you the idea that very small amounts have powerful effects on the body. In fact, the body turns them into powerful hormones called eicosanoids. Now, back then in our environment, these two fatty acids were broadly speaking in balance. And what one did, one, the other one would undo. So, for example, if one increased blood pressure, the other one decreased blood pressure. If the other one increased bone building, the other one decreased it. And back then, it kind of balanced itself out just nice. What we've done today is lock down, and it's happened just in my lifetime, lock down that seesaw just on one side. So this is the seesaw locked down. And just so as you know, olive oil is in the middle of the seesaw. It doesn't actually play any part in this. It's an omega-9 acid. Um, so the... The mischief maker is an omega-6 fatty acids, omega-6 oils. Now, can anybody who hasn't already heard me speak or know, know about this um, give me some examples of omega-6 oils? Sunflower oil, yeah. Okay, any, any others? Okay, well, let's just whip through it. Uh, sunflower, there it is. Peanut oil, corn oil, maize oil, safflower oil are, two big one, uh, are the big ones. Uh, and these have come into our diet just very recently. You know, when I was young man even, we were still using lard to cook things with and everybody said, well that's bad fat, saturated fat, which it absolutely is, but we jumped from one frying pan into another frying pan, if you like, um, to, by taking on the omega-6 oils. Soybean and walnut are also on the, not on the side of the angels, um, whereas the other side of the balance is, or the seesaw, is omega-3 oils. Can somebody give me an example of omega-3 oils? Fish oils, flaxseed oil, yes, good. Rapeseed, rape yeah, hey, good. So here we are, that's the fish oil and the flaxseed oil. Omega-3 rich eggs, by the way, are very good there. Um, and the rapeseed and hemp seed oil is, is another one. But the net result of this overbalanced thing is that we're overproducing these eicosanoids, or hormones, 
And they've got names like leukotrienes and thromboxanes and uh, prostaglandin series 2. And they are doing things like increasing artery disease, increasing depressing immune system and cancers to, to flourish, uh, increasing blood clotting, increasing allergies, increasing bone disease, increasing asthma, blood pressure, increasing blood pressure, and a subject in Alzheimer's. And underlying it all is their propensity to increase inflammation in the body. So this is another big way in which we are uh, undermining our health by cons over consuming the omega-6 oils. And the challenge is to unload those omega-6s. Sure, you want to make sure you've got a little bit of omega-3, but you don't need a lot. You only need a gram a day of each. Uh, and the challenge is to get rid of that omega-6 oils. And the trouble is it's in everything. Uh, you know, if, even if you've not deliberately gone out and bought the sunflower oil or the safflower oil, um, it's, it's still in all the processed foods. It's, uh, it's what the, you know, all the big fast food restaurants use for frying their chips and so forth. So let's just quickly look. This is the actual rate at which vegetable oil consumption has changed just since 1965. In other words, it's gone up five times. And this is another factor. It doesn't say that on the side of the sunflower oil bottle that the Surgeon General has determined that this could be dangerous to your health, but it ought to. It ought to have a, a health warning on it. Um, vegetable oils. So let's just have a quick look at an aspect that you probably won't hear about very much, and that is triglycerides. All right, we all worry about triglycerides when you get, a, when you get your blood test back and they, they say, well, they're too high. I mean, it's just another word for fats or oils that are in the bloodstream, which is a perfectly normal thing. All fats and oils that we're going to be eating are actually in the form of triglycerides. And a triglyceride is a glycerol molecule to which are attached fatty acids. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that the fatty acid in what is called position 1 is not bioavailable, and the fatty acid that is in position 3 is not bioavailable. It is only the fatty acid that is in position 2 that is uh, bioavailable. Depending on which oil you're using, so the good or the bad fatty acids might be sitting there on position 2, or not. Unless it's not Get, let's get it clear. All oils, I talked about sunflower oil being an omega-6, it's because it is predominantly omega-6, but it has other fatty acids in there too, uh, and it, it makes a difference. All these oils are, are cocktails. Um, so let's look at what this actually means in practice. I talked about these two central fatty acids needing to be in balance. Actually, that's an ideal. It's good enough if there are, even if they're at 1 to 2, the omega-6, 2 to uh, 1 of omega-3. Now, if we take canola, rain, rapeseed oil, uh, and if we just look at the nutrient database that is produced by the British authorities or the American authorities, and you look and see how much, you've, how much of omega-6 it's got in, you see it's got actually four times as much omega-6 in it as it's got omega-3. Ah, but if you look at the, where these omega-3s are sitting on the triglyceride molecule, you find that most of the omega-3 is sitting in position 2 where it's bioavailable, and a large part of the omega-6 is sitting on positions 1 and 3 where it's not bioavailable. So that brings it into a balance that is actually acceptable. And this is the kind of little bits of detail we have to go into when we're starting to look at all these foodstuffs that we've got in our diets to understand whether or not they're actually going to be okay for us or not. Now, this doesn't apply simply to, uh, well, let's just look also at one or two others. There's sunflower oil, which has that kind of position of uh, fatty acid, and that's corn oil, uh, maize oil. And if we look at position 2, sunflower oil actually has the bad omega-6s right there, bioavailable, which is why sunflower oil is actually much worse than corn oil, which has still, nevertheless, quite a bit of, of its f uh, bad fatty acid in position 2 and bioavailable. We're not only talking about polyunsaturated fats, a quick look at saturated fats. Tallow, which is beef fat, 
is, uh, if you just look at it crudely, that's the situation. If you look at lard, it doesn't seem to have so much saturated fat. If you look at cocoa butter, it seems to have a lot of saturated fat. And ditto for real, but ordinary butter, dairy butter. But when you look at what is bioavailable, then you see that tallow actually has quite a low amount of saturated fat bioavailable. And on top of it, a lot of this saturated fat is stearic acid, which our body knows how to handle. It turns it into olive oil, in fact. Uh, lard, on the mean, which is pork fat, hey, has most of its bad fats sitting where it's bioavailable, which is why pork fat really is, and pork in general, is really a problem for our arteries and so forth. Cocoa butter is right down there. Again, the saturated fat in cocoa butter is sitting down there on the, very little of it is actually bioavailable, which is why cocoa butter uh, and coconut oil and palm oil are actually okay, even though they're classed as saturated fats. Uh, and finally, is butter itself, dairy butter, again, has most of its <laughs> saturated fat is bioavailable and to create as much mischief as it likes. Uh, I'm going to take you through very quickly through a history of what's going on <coughs> when we are converting these omega-6 oils or omega-3 oils into these hormones. Let's have a quick look because it illustrates a couple of interesting points. You, know, you, you take in one of these vegetable oils and it hits a, an enzyme called delta-6 desaturase which turns, which creates another compound called GLA which is very, of which evening primrose is very rich and people sometimes take evening primrose oil thinking that it will be helping their arthritis. Uh, then it's converted into yet another compound called DGLA, uh, and it hits another uh, compound called an, en an enzyme called delta-5 desaturase. Now this is a kind of switching enzyme. The more there is of it, so it goes one way, and the less there is of it, so the process goes another way. If we look at, if there's less of it around, then we start to make what we might call good hormones, which are, which reduce, amongst other things, which reduce inflammation, which reduce pain, and which reduce swelling. In other words, you've taken that evening primrose oil and it's helped your arthritis. And what has helped that happen is if you've had a diet which is had some fish oils in it. Fish oils, of course, are already converted into all these things. It doesn't need to go through all this process. This is a very highly simplified thing, of course. Uh, and if you've got glucagon circulating, so if you're feeling slightly hungry and your body is producing glucagon, then you're more likely to switch this process into producing the so-called good hormones. On the other hand, if you're suffering from stress, if you're, you've got cortisol floating around, you're diabetic, you're obese, you have starches and sugars, you're eating a high glycemic diet, you're increasing insulin, which, and insulin, increases delta-5 desaturase, which means that you then produce more arachidonic acid, which is producing bad hormones, which is then increasing inflammation, pain, and swelling. So suddenly, what worked one day for your arthritis is not working the next day because you had a high glycemic diet, or you're stressed, or something else going on in the body. Now the lesson I want to take from this is, you, you can't second guess this. This is a highly <coughs> simplified diagram of what's going on. It's like five-dimensional chess, really, what's going on. But I've tried, I want to get across this point. You can't second guess what this body is doing to yourself. There's so many other things going on at the same time. But the important thing is that if you put this body into the situation which it recognises, then it sorts itself out just fine. <laughs>